Hello and welcome to the AV Forums podcast for Monday the 27th of January 2020. And joining me on this edition is Steve Withers. Me and Jenny goes together like peas and carrots. And Ed Sally. I'm Dorothy Harris. And welcome back to the podcast. It's still January. It's the 2700th Just. day of January. It's nearly payday. It's, we're nearly there. I'm full of the flu as well. I'm, I'm not as bad as I was on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, where Saturday, Sunday I didn't get out of my bed. Um, at all. Seem to be getting a bit better now, but I'm actually sitting here sweating away now. The house If is you're out of cold. bed, have you taken the opportunity to wash your bedding? Uh, not yet, Ed. Not yet. No. Well, that sounds just, a lot I, like work, Ed, which I don't think anyone wants to do when they're not well. No, <laughs> no but it, I, I know, you ha- but one, getting back into clean bedding is awesome, and it's just, just getting rid of all possible sources of infection. It, it's it's not a fun thing. It, you haven't it's got never this coronavirus, have you? No, I haven't, I haven't felt the need for a corona with Lyme yet, so <laughs> I should be okay. Fair enough. But no, 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 but get get your bedding washed. I'm okay. going to mother you. <laughs> okay, mum. <laughs> it, it appears to be a little bit better today, but I I am at the minute going through different temperatures. Um, so I am sweating as as we speak, but I no doubt it'll be freezing cold in about half an hour. So, But I've I've gone this far into the winter before getting it, so I'm quite happy with that, that I didn't get it when I was out at CES or anything like that. It's, um, but I've no doubt I've caught something on the plane. Yeah, cause I've, That's I've been usually, the plane. yeah. Don't, come, don't go anywhere near... I always like to quote Apocalypse Now. Never, ever get out of the boat. That's my rule in life. <laughs> Never get out of the boat. <laughs> yeah, well, I was on a plane this week, wasn't I? So I was over to Amsterdam. And, and of course, walking through Schiphol, which is one of the busiest airports on yeah, the planet. Yeah, that's much more likely. I mean, I'm, I hope you were listening to the Contagion soundtrack. Actually, on you, might, you might have uh, coronavirus. You probably, that's a major international hub. You yeah. Know? Yeah, well. We can all be smug because he's several hundred miles away from me. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not leaving the house for the next couple of weeks just in case. <laughs> Sucks to be you in Durham. But, you know. Actually, to be honest, I lived in Hong Kong during the SARS epidemic. And you know what? It, the media made it into much more than it actually was. And it was great for me because I could always get a table in a, in a restaurant. There was no one around. Everyone was empty. It was brilliant. I, I liked it. More of that. Yeah. More I, pandemics. I, That's what we need. It's, <laughs> it's all going to directly affect me. <laughs> it's, uh, did anybody catch um, Chris, Chris, Packham. Chris Packham? Did you see his latest series of 7.7 billion of us and we need to get, we need to basically... Well, nature will, contr- nature will find a way, either through a pandemic, a bloody great asteroid or a war, but we will get thinned out at some point. Yeah. <laughs> We're basically a virus in shoes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not wearing any shoes at the moment, actually, if I'm honest. Yeah, but always people go, oh, yeah, it's the end of the world. No, it's not. The world will be fine, particularly without us. It might be the end of humanity, but that's not necessarily a bad thing as far as planet Earth's concerned. Yeah, yeah. But it was just telling that, that a programme like that was being you know, released by the BBC, because in the past, people just did not want to talk about stuff like that. No, true. I also think maybe, do you think Netflix might have started this pandemic because they released a new a new documentary series about pandemics yeah, last which, Friday? Yeah, I watched that. that yeah. well Are you <laughs> suggesting this is the most cynical marketing exercise yeah. of all time? <laughs> right, okay, noted. Also, when they thought 56 dead. 56 dead out of a population of 1.3 billion. You've probably got more chance of being hit on the head by an asteroid. Uh, well, not, and hang on a second. We're, we're, let's not understate the numbers. Unusually, we're recording this on a Monday, um, and we're up to 81 now. 81 out of 1.3 billion. Yes. Well, um, I mean, look, the thing Massive. is, that there's, two, there's two, two elements to this. There's a positive and there's not so positive. It does appear to be something which, if you are in reasonable health, uh, uh, with no other underlying conditions, it's not a gar- It's not you know like septicemic plague. What's less encouraging is reading between the lines that uh, it would appear to that the that there is. It, it looks pretty clear now that there is human to human transition tra- transmission, and um, that happens before your before symptoms, symptoms, be- yeah. symptoms display, which that's is that's bit. a bit of a pig to get on top of. Hmm. So yeah, there you are. Yeah, and it's tragic when anybody yeah loses their life. Yeah. To- so yeah, we're not we're not making fun of it at all, but yeah, it's quite worrying. I might have it. Yeah, well, you, you if you Probably if you're in you're right. the northeast of England, just you know, Phil has the equivalent of uh, the uh, the Red Cross on his door. If you see if there's a bright green Ford Mustang lying around, just 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 cross the other side of the road. You'd be fine. <laughs> hey, what have you been up, Ted? Uh, not a huge amount. Uh, I've been working. Um, uh, I was bullied by my son yesterday. I had to. I had to. I was looking after him yesterday, uh, wet, 
dull Sunday. Oh, can we do some baking? Now, what I, th- those of you who are listening who are parents will know exactly what this means. You think, oh, what but an opportunity for some father-son bonding. What actually happens is that you get stuff. Um, your child, male or female, will assist you, by which I mean make a mess and break something for about six minutes. And then you're left to produce a pie that you actually have no burning desire to eat at the end of that. I mean, I, I, I'm not going to lie. It's, I've made a, a reasonably good apple and blackberry pie, but I'm not really a big fan of sweet things. It's just sort of sat there. So, uh, yeah, we did that. Uh, I watched Top Gear last night. Um, and uh, as I say, I was amusing. Uh, Phil uh, put on Twitter that he, you know, these two a big Yamaha processor and power amp turned up. You know, two big boxes. I'll grant you that. Lots of connections. I installed a seven-box amplifier last week. Why? Well, because it's here for it's review. A job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but why <laughs> seven? Choice. Why seven boxes? Is pre-amp, it just all preamps? No, preamp, uh, external crossover, power supply for the external crossover, and four mono power amplifiers. Right. Why me? Okay. Something, um, something it, they could have put in one box, basically. Ooh, that would have been a struggle, wouldn't it? With a, with an external crossover active system doing it in one chassis. Yeah, I suppose. How expensive is that? Um, seven and a bit. So compared to you, beryllium boy, nothing catastrophically expensive. <laughs> I've got to say this Yamaha kit. It's uh, it's one thing with the MKs that work well with with higher end AVRs, um, and higher end AVRs can power them, but. They absolutely thrive on decent amplification, yeah, separate yeah. amplification. And what a difference, just hooking up a separate amplifier, running things at the same volume, but just so much more in terms of the transient shifts. Um, and l- l- night and day, it a- absolutely wakes up these MKs. So I think I need to invest in some amplification going forward, I think, because, uh, uh, yeah, the big, it- the big AVRs are good at running this stuff, but... There's yeah. no replacement for displacement. Yeah, you know and there's, there's there's no room, there's no headroom there with an AVR, whereas there's, there's tons of headroom with a separate. It sounds app. like there's going to be some uh, ebullient reviews coming up because uh, I don't want to. I'm not going to give too much away, but I've got uh, what is uh, it's not the most expensive loudspeaker I've ever listened to um, by actually by a long shot, even in a domestic sense. But uh, being reviewed for you guys is. It has to be said. This is the speaker I covet above all others. I have, I've, I've dusted off my big book of excuses for why I don't want to give them back, um, and I'll be working through that in uh, in a chronological fashion. But yeah, one of one of my January review products has has moved me on an emotional level. So yeah. <laughs> okay. Here we go. It's going to be an expensive year. <laughs> Well, Withers just did thirty. What was it? Thirty-two thousand grand. I yeah. Think and in fairness, I didn't review. I had a pair of ten thousand pounds stand mounts come through recently. I thought oh, I'm going to look at these for for somebody. No, no, no. This just the, I just envisaged the comments from same people. I was <laughs> going Ed what? And it's like no. Uh, let's just let's just <laughs> let that sleeping dog lie, shall we? So uh, these ones are a mere seven thousand pounds. A very good value. Yeah, good stuff. <laughs> what have you been doing, isn't it? What have you been doing, Steve? Um, not much. I was away at the weekend. I, annoyingly, I had to get out of the boat, which uh, <laughs> always annoys me because that means meeting other people. Uh, yeah, I was down in, down in Devon for the weekend, um, which is why we're recording this on a Monday morning. Although it sounds like you wouldn't able to do it anyway. Oh, there's until, no way you would have gotten me last night. Yeah. No. So, um, so probably fortuitous. Um, otherwise, yeah. What, Watch some, watch some movies. Did a, did a bit of calibrating. Yeah, yeah. Living, stuff. living the dream. Well, living, was, yeah, living the dream. <laughs> we've got plenty to talk about, so let's let's crack on. So uh, before we talk hardware and so on, Ed, why don't you run us through the current competitions, please? Um, very well. Uh, let's go all the way back up to the top of the running order. You can win a copy of Pain and Glory on Blu-ray, open till the fourth of Feb. Excuse me. Win a copy of It Chapter Two on Blu-ray and a copy of the original novel. That's novel. Uh, oh, that's also open to the 4th of Feb. Uh, win copies of Criterion's January titles on Blu-ray. Uh, being their holiday, Sancho the Bailiff. Uh, that's open to the 11th of Feb. 
win a copy of the miracle worker on blu-ray uh, also to the 11th of feb uh, and win a copy of cloak and dagger on blu-ray open to the 12th of feb lots more competitions are open or being added daily so head over to avforums.com slash forward slash competitions to enter even more ellipsis uh, all competitions are open to eligible av forums members resident in the uk basically to everyone except phil we've covered this um previous competition winners because there are some tonka toys one blinded by the light on blu-ray uh, old Bill Goggles won Criteria's December titles on Blu-ray, and Dorothy Merritt won Clockwise on Blu-ray. So well done to you all. Yeah, well done, and uh, we'll be back in a sec with Hardware. Okay, moving on to Hardware. Like I said earlier, I uh, I was over in Amsterdam earlier in the week, last week, uh, because it's the Philips TV launch event, or their uh, home entertainment launch event, held annually at the Hilton Hotel at Schiphol Airport. So um, it's nice and easy to get to. You basically fly to Schiphol, get off the plane. Um, you're met by... The virus. <laughs> you're met by the uh, somebody at the gate who then walks you across the hotel, which is miles away. You keep forgetting just how far the hotel actually is. It's a it's a good walk. I did a good six thousand steps to get there, and then the events in the hotel, and then you come out of the hotel again and go back to your gate and on a plane and back home again. Uh, so in terms of getting there and getting back, it's nice and easy. Um, you do get away from the hotel on the evening. We go out for dinner, so it's actually quite a laid back event, which I do it literally like. a laid back event. It was. I'm coming on to that. So. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I mean, the way these things work, um, sometimes press trips like this or press events, you do a lot of travelling, you get there and then they bombard you with loads of information, um, take you on tours, showing you loads of kit and all the rest of it, and you're you're really just not in the mood for it, because you've just gotten off a plane and, and you've been travelling since, you know, 7 or 8am, sometimes even earlier than that for, for me to get to places. This is a bit more laid back, so you, you have time uh, to have some lunch and then they have a, a plenary which is basically the press conference where they tell you what the you you can expect to see over the course of the the next day. Then you have some more drinks um, and you go out for dinner with them. Um, and then the last bus back is about midnight, and then you start again at nine a.m. with some workshops. So you're all split into groups. Basically, we were split into a UK group. I think it was about twelve of us from the UK. Um, and then you go through different workshops. So Danny's. A picture processing workshop, you have the uh, smart TV and LCD and all that kind of thing and then there's Bowser Wilkins by Andy Kerr it's good to meet up with Andy again um, so lots of different things um, different rooms to go into the, they're making a big thing about Fidelio coming back because now TP Vision own that um, so they expect some big things probably IFA, one of the things that I did take away from the event was IFA is going to be big this year for, for Philips because although they had product to show us um, most of it was wait wait and see what's coming um, which basically says that's going to be it's going to be EFA, um, which is end of August, beginning of September. Um, in terms of TVs, I'm going to be quick with this because there, there wasn't an awful lot announced to be honest um, and there was one OLED TV which they give three uh, different model numbers too because of the different stands but they're basically the same TV so you had the 805, 855 and 865 and like I say the difference is the stand so the 805 has a traditional stand the 855 has a slightly different design to it and the 865 has some leather added and you can swivel it other than that it's the same panel with the same technology um, same features so Dolby Vision um, HDR10 Plus is on board as the fourth generation P5 processor. Uh, difference over the the third gen is that it's now added AI, which uses the neural networks, the same as if what everybody else is yeah. is doing at the moment um, in terms of analysing, uh, you know, picture quality and making sure that you know objects look the way they should, not overly sharpened and so on. It's something that Philips do really well. It's something that Danny Tack does does really well is is the picture processing. Even though I'm not a big fan of it and myself and Danny keep joking on about how we're you know two peas from completely different pods but when you know you can't deny that the stuff that they do with the picture processing is really really good and and far better than a lot of others in the marketplace who claim that they can do this and that um Philips actually do take a lot of time um with their picture processing and it's everything from motion to you know skin tones um sharpening edge enhancement all that kind of thing but but done in a subtle and balanced way so it's it's not overly obvious what's going on 
the Vivid Mode's now AI mode, although Vivid Mode is still there, but the, the feedback from the AV Forums event from AV Forums member was, uh, yeah, it's good what you're doing in Vivid Mode, but don't call it Vivid Mode because that's what puts people off. So they've now changed it to AI mode. So basically, it's got it's got everything running on there. Um, most of the things that myself and Steve would would probably turn off, but um, but yeah, um, like I say, they're good at what they're doing. If you like your image processing, you like your image smoothing and that kind of thing, there's plenty to choose from. Um, uh, uh, with the film, uh, a question, Phil. Yeah. <laughs> so, what was Danny's take on filmmaker mode then? Right, uh, not his favourite mode. <laughs> I think that might be the case. Yeah, um, but, he, but they but, are going to have it, aren't they? they are yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, also, he also said it doesn't contradict anything that they are doing. So it's basically given the consumer choice. Um, yeah. And he said it's because I asked the question. I don't know if he saw the video interview, but I did. I did say to him, I know you. I know what your answer is going to be, Danny. But you, you've got a mode in here that switches everything that you've spent all year working on off. So you're not going <laughs> to like it, are you? And he says it's not my favourite mode. No. Um, but yeah, they're going to do filmmaker mode, the same as they do movie mode, and the the TVs are usually quite accurate. Out yeah, the but they've always well, had so. ISF mode as well, haven't they? Yeah, so they, yeah. they've the, had that option. It's always been there. Yeah, yeah, they've always had that. The big push this year was uh, Ambulite, so it's only taken them over a decade to realise that the USP is Ambulite. People really like it. <laughs> but people really do like it. I, I really like Ambulite. Now, I don't like it when it follows the video, and there's a clip in the video that, um, that I put up last week, um, which was the Phantom Menace, and it was using two hue bulbs either side of the TV as well in the lights. So it Everything was following what was going on 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 screen, and, and and it was just too much. At least it took took your your eye off the Phantom Menace. You know what I mean? Um, yes, but, <laughs> why did they pick that? Because it was on Disney Plus. They were showing oh, Disney right. Plus, so uh, so it was on that. Um, but yeah, Ambulate's a big thing. But they they do have ISF mode in there, which does do D sixty five white, solid white, and yeah. then you can adjust the uh, the brightness of that behind the TV to get to get it right. And it is a scientifically proven um, thing, bias lighting. Um, it does they help do it the in, eye. Uh, it stops fatigue. Suites, no? Yeah. It's always been in Authoring Suites. Uh, you've yeah. always had lights behind the uh, master monitors and, and so on. Um, and it stops the fatigue of the eye. So it stops your iris opening and closing uh, all and the time. see your biscuits in the dark. Yes. And having a cup of tea, which is yeah. always important. <laughs> or, find, or better still, find the remote control. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so, so there's some, some decent stuff there in terms of OLED. They also had their um, uh, LED LCD TVs. Um, so the interest there is the 9235 and 9435 um, are LED TVs, but they now have the Bowers and Wilkins. Um, now, they don't like you calling it a sound bar. Um, but that's why it is. It's basically a Bowers and Wilkins sound bar. If you've seen the OLED Plus 934, it's the same um, sound bar. So with the upward firing drivers, um, the same shape. Uh, the only difference is the size, because the 9235 is 43 inch, um, and then the 9435 is 15 above. So there's the the width of the sound bar is different for the smaller screen, but same uh, basic layout, same drivers. Um, sounds really impressive. I mean, the 934 was a really impressive sounding TV um, with the upward firing drivers and so on. And I, I spent some time with uh, with Andy Kerr just talking about you know the, the sound and so on. And we came on to the uh, the OLED Plus 984 which you reviewed, Steve, uh, which was there um, as a centrepiece and, and having a look in. Did you hear it? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a really, it's, it's a great sound. It's, it's superb. And and my thing was, well, you know, it's everything's great apart from the fact that it hasn't got upper fire and speakers. Well, they're working on Series 2 of that and they're looking at, at ways of how they implement uh, upward firing speaker within that speaker bar, same type of design. So that could be interesting if the if that comes out as a, as a series two, um, it, that could be quite interesting because it is a cracking TV. I mean, beautiful looking TV. Yeah, um, the way the stand and everything just flows and the tweeters built into the stand and so on. So, uh, so yeah, so LED uh, OLED. But like I say, it was like they were holding back. I mean, um, Fidelio is coming, but uh, sound bar solutions look like they're going to be later in the year for the UK. Um, which again points to IFA. Um, there was only the 800 series. Obviously, there's always a 900 series. Um, so again, that points to IFA. No HDMI 2.1. No full bandwidth, uh, 48 gigabits per second. Uh, 2.1. No VRR. So yeah, so that's a that's a little bit disappointing uh, for those that are looking at, at future proofing. Although Philips will tell you and Daniel will tell you as well that y you really don't need it at the moment. Um, but some of these things can be delivered using HDMI 2.0. So, I, but I think personally, uh, I think 
when it comes to consumers, they're always going to take boxes. Um, and there's, there's no way around that. So technically, you could be correct in saying that, well, we could deliver this using 2.0. People want 2.1. They just want to see 2.1 on the TV. Yeah, so they, they want that. Because, I mean, manufacturers often promise things and then they don't always deliver them. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I think when you buy any product, buy it based upon what it can do when you buy it and what it might not what it might do at some later point if they decide to update the firmware because um, a lot of people have been caught out that way in the past. Yeah. Uh, also, no Dolby Vision IQ at the moment and picture... Uh, picture modes, the filmmaker mode, is not there at the moment. It is coming this year, as is um, Dolby Vision IQ. But Daniel was basically oh, it is said, coming, is it? Oh, it's IQ. coming, but it's not there at the moment. Um, is, that, is that going to be a firmware update, or will that be on the new lineup that they announced? They, they didn't say. So it's something that I can double check on later this week, and and if there is any update on that, I can update it. But um, basically, it, it's coming soon. Basically, um, uh, and what Danny was saying is that their Dolby Bright mode actually uses the uh, um, the, um, intelligent sensor. the intelligent sensor already. The problem is the, their Dolby Bright has everything switched on as well. It has um, image smoothing and all the rest of <laughs> it's it. It's a full-on Danny mode. <laughs> it is, yeah. Um, so, I mean, to get Dolby uh, Vision IQ properly where it follows the uh, director's intent, you're going to have to wait for that. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of things were pointing towards EFA, which um, which is a good thing. Because obviously they're working on new product. I saw the 8K um, OLED; it looked impressive. 88 inches. It's going to be really expensive at that, that <laughs> screen point. Be cheap. Um, but there was also a couple of really nice features that are not on the fourth gen uh, P5, but what stuff that Danny was showing off. So um, some highly compressed video where you get lots of uh, gradation, banding, all that kind of thing. Um, they have a new process which looks at that. It's, normally, it's what you would find with uh, YouTube content and so on. Um, so they have a, a, a new... It's like a smooth gradation feature, basically. It's probably the best way I could describe it, where it smooths everything out without um, making things overly smooth and unnatural. Uh, but it gets rid of the banding and so on that you see in skies or um, uh, bright backgrounds behind. Uh, they had like a face and a background behind it, and there was lots of banding going on there. And it, and it cleaned it up without... You know, ov- overly processing the image, so that was quite impressive. And another feature they had was, um, I think LG's had it on their TVs for a number of years now, where it, it uh, detects the AI detects um, dog on the screen. So, you know, CNN or Sky News or whatever, where you have the crawlers and all that kind of thing, and the station dogs and stuff. It it I actually thought for a minute you meant it could detect a dog and tell you what kind of dog. It was. <laughs> No, because no, I mean, that, I was thinking that would was be impressive. I, I had a demo at Samsung where they were, do, were saying basically that, you know, the AI process, you know, it can recognize that what you're seeing is a cat. I was thinking, well, you can recognize what species a cat is? Uh, <laughs> sorry, yeah, so you threw me for a second and I was thinking. No, like, I meant, I meant okay. dog yeah, as, I know as, in the, as in, the, you know, the, <laughs> the channel uh, ident and so on. Um, so it recognizes this. It takes uh, about 30 seconds to do that and then it will apply dimming in certain areas of the image to stop image retention so if you're gaming and you got a bright hard uh, hard up on the screen it'll um it'll figure that out and then it'll adjust it so i think lg's been doing that for a, a number of the, the last thing to go on to is uh, android 9 pi uh, which is running on all the tvs um i've never had an issue with a philips tv they've always had um decent process and power to manage android and again it looks nice and slick and like i say disney plus coming uh, in march um, so yeah, it, it was a good event, uh, really interesting event. Um, the the opening evening um, was quite entertaining as well because they had us lying on the floor. So basically, it was a it was an old st- it looked like an old steel mill with cranes uh, and stuff that ran along the the ceiling, um, and uh, they had different sections of of this work work area. So. You went in, first of all, had canopies and uh, finger food, that kind of thing. Then went into another room where we all lay on the floor looking up at two giant screens. And it was kind of like the 4DX cinema experience. I don't know if you've been in a 4DX screen um, where they spray water at you and if there's flames, you feel the heat off the yeah. flames and that kind of So it was basically it was a, it was a promo for their, their TV lineup and... Um, that flames and flamethrowers and all that kind of thing and confetti. Thankfully, the confetti didn't go off at the same time as the flamethrowers. Otherwise, that could have been quite messy. Um, but yeah, it was it was 
yeah, it, it was a nice experience. And then we went from there into another room where um, it was like street food. So they had like stalls doing street food round about uh, central bar area. Um, and you could try all different types of food, everything from sushi to um, uh, risottos and all that kind of thing. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a really entertaining evening. So uh, a nice event. I think the main stuff from Philips is definitely going to come at IFA. I think there's there's going to be some major announcements then, um, mainly the, the high-end TV. Uh, there's definitely a 9 series coming. It'll be interesting to see if that has HDMI 2.1, Dolby Vision IQ, all that kind of thing. It'll be interesting to see if that's fully loaded that way. But, but yeah, interesting event. Um, interesting TVs. We'll get them in for a review as soon as we can. And um, the 754, which is out at the minute, now under a thousand pounds uh, i'm hoping to get one of those in in the next week or two um to have a look at that and see if it's actually worth buying it under a grand for a 55 inch 55 inch oled with hdm uh, hdr 10 plus and dolby vision right yep well it has Pretty the it has the lower end um smart tv system but it doesn't have android it has what they call it i can't remember um safi that's it isn't it yeah safi yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. But that'll be interesting. No, uh, that'll be interesting. Look, I've still got a, a LG C9 here that I can put side by side, and one of the Samsung QLEDs as well. So, so yeah, I'll be getting that in soon because it's quiet season at the minute for TVs. That's why we're all, we were talking audio earlier on. So, um, so yeah, so talking audio, it's a trend dead that we've seen for a while now. Uh, people downsizing. It was again something that I had a long conversation with Andy Kerr about with. You know the, the way that they see uh, Bowser Milk and see the market going as well, like that, that way where people are downsizing, getting rid of the seven one or five one speaker systems in the living room and going to maybe one or two channels. Um, so we've seen interest in product from Marantz, which is uh, the first crossover product I think they've done as a company. Am I right? It's certainly the first that takes this form. Uh, yes, I mean I'm in the midst of writing a column at the moment. Um, for the, which will go up in the next month or so about the growth of these products and why why they've come to be and also explaining that um much as we might like to credit this industry with the ability to sort of map things out and plan extensively ahead of time for the most part they don't um it, it, it's an inherently opportunistic business model um but the nr1200 is uh a product that takes the slimline chassis that we've seen uh, a couple of Marantz AV receivers use um, and just switches down to two channels, uh, but retains the HDMI connectivity, uh, the HEOS network ability. You can uh, set up subwoofers to run with it and so on and so forth. It doesn't have automatic calibration. Uh, and the long and the short of it is that if you had ha had a, a multi-channel system up until this point and you're thinking, do you know what? I can't be bothered to have five plus speakers in the room anymore. This is the product that allows you to run the two speakers, but keeps you able to use the um, the functionality that you've grown used to in having an AV receiver. Ed, is, is yes. it a 2.1 system? Well, it doesn't have to be, but it, sorry, just had to move me. It, it doesn't have to be, but it can be. What I mean, uh, what I mean by that is that it, there's not a third channel, so you can't run a, a dialogue no, channel. No, 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 just two, just two channels. Um, it's closest in construction and design. The nearest thing, I suppose, would be the old Arcam SR250, although that actually had multi-channel decoding and down mixed to two channel. This doesn't do that. Um, but equally, the Arcan was several thousand pounds and the Marantz is, is 600 quid and can be found for substantially less than that. You have to essentially work on this. There's an article of faith to anyone stepping down from a multi-channel system that, you know, there's going to be no um, uh, sort of surround processing. Nothing is going to happen around you. But used with a, a relatively competent pair of speakers the effect is is generally more immersive than people give credit for and i would say in particular whilst i'm not going to make any great promises about it bouncing sound to the back of your head there are no issues with dialogue via stereo uh, and i i say this in a more general sense as that is now how i consume all my film and tv material via two loudspeakers rather than five and it just doesn't seem to make a substantial difference 
if it's done correctly. I think I would argue with that. But I, I know where you're coming from. If you're talking about a living room environment, I know exactly. I want to know, to rephrase that, if you do something random, like simply take a multi-channel soundtrack and emit the one emit the channel in the center, yeah, that's going to sound catastrophic. What I'm suggesting is that if you, ha- if you are accessing the two-channel mix of something, it doesn't, in in a domestic sense, yes. I mean, obviously, I wouldn't want to go to the, the cinema and watch something in stereo. Um, the effect in a standard room with two competent loudspeakers, you shouldn't get any form of hole in the middle. And that applies to listening to music or watching television or whatever, it, provided that they are the two speakers are placed correctly and are remotely competent. You will get a full sound, uh, get a correct sound field across the front of your listening. Mm. Um, the, I mean, the net result of this is a six hundred pound product that does a huge amount. So you've got HDMI inputs, you've got digital inputs, it's got a DAB FM module, internet radio, HEOS. Obviously. Um, and I make this point in the review, if you compare it to a £600 amplifier like a Riga Brio, um, that's going to stomp all over it because that does does two of the things that the Marantz does. And Marantz does another six or seven of them. But it is, I think it's a, a great value for money product. And it just, it's another option out there. Again, I mean, obviously to put it into perspective, there's no, there's again, no, no sort of sense of it's not going to generate a surround field like the Ambio is. But if you budgeted for the Morants, and what, what's how much is the Ambio, Steve? Two thousand. Oh, and that, in that case, it doesn't even need to be that far up the food chain, the uh, soundbar food chain. Essentially, if you budgeted another six hundred pounds for speakers, yeah, you aren't going to get stuff echoing off the back of your head but when it comes then to listening to music or even it has to be said just um listen listening to certain you know more sort of complex and large scale things it's just fundamentally going to deliver a, a, a more satisfying and, 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 and cogent performance than um than, than a lot of these large deluxe soundbars are going to do hey, yes how many hdmi inputs does it have four Okay, well, that's already better than most uh, yes. sound bars. Uh, I think possibly only the one exception might be the, off the top of my head, I think the Sennheiser might have four, or could be three, actually. The only does, thing, it support EA, does it support EARC? Uh, not as it stands, and I couldn't get confirmation as to whether it does HDR10+, plus, although there seems to be some implication that it does, but I couldn't test that. Right. Um, so, it, it, you know, it gets an awful lot done, um, and... I would also say, I'm sure, obviously, presumably, there must be a sound bar or, or object similar to that, which also makes use of the HEOS system. But, I mean, yeah, HEOS is... the HEOS sound bar. <laughs> well, amazing. There you go. <laughs> HEOS, is, HEOS is a good operating, a good streaming operating system. Um, I don't like the fact that it queues. Uh, I, I hate play queue systems on streaming apps. It's a personal bugbear of mine but otherwise i can't fault it it was stable reliable easy to set up and did everything i expected it to um and it's going to make the business of enjoying your music you know essentially the it, as the gateway to your music collection it's it's the thing that makes it a a, a pleasant undertaking and it, it manages to do that um it's not the only product of its type that we've got uh, sort of lined up and planned for either. We've got another product with a solitary HDMI arc collect, uh, connection in the tank ready to go, although that's admittedly four and a half thousand pounds, so a little bit different to the to the Marantz. But then if you can live without the HDMI connections, and based on the sheer number of inputs that a number of modern televisions have, many people can, there is another take on this sort of product from Quad. Uh, which is also in the tank ready to go. So I've been looking at this from many different angles and then there will be a column to uh, to accompany it as well. So yes, it, it, it's a busy time. It, it, it would appear that there's now a concerted effort to be going after people who are down, downsizing from multi-channel. Um, we can examine why they might be doing that across <laughs> over the year. Um, but yeah, there's there's lots of different ways of doing that. And if you like the Marantz, is one of them a the most affordable and b one of the most comprehensive. So it's it's a very impressive product. I would say I don't have an audio system in my living room. Do you, Steve? No, not currently. 
<laughs> I've just been using the TVs uh, or standby when they're in for you. I mean, given the stuff that ships in and out all the time, it seems pointless. I used yeah. to, yeah. but um, it became largely redundant um, just because of the nature of you know of, of my job that there was always stuff going in and out of the lounge anyway. Yeah. Plus, there's always a reticence. If I make the lounge too good, Sheer laziness will mean I, I won't go in the home cinema. cinema room. Like, yeah. <laughs> Whereas, uh, obviously, I only, I only operate in a single room. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I will say, um, uh, you might find this amusing. As I say, I now run my television through, um, through, through whatever happens to be in the room at the time. So, um, about two weeks ago, I sat down and watched Ready Player One. Uh, going into a Cord Electronics M Scaler and TT2 DAC. So that's like seven and a half thousand pounds. But then running into a 10 watt valve amplifier and a pair of high sensitivity audio note loudspeakers um, for one of the more surreal cinematic effects that I've, I've done in quite a while. I, I, I'm not going to lie. I was a little bit down on headroom in some of the big fight sequences, but it sounded quite nice. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, and just before we wrap up hardware, very, very quickly, uh, a number of people have contacted me via the messaging system, via Twitter, etc. Obviously, um, if you haven't been living in a cave or been stuck in bed, uh, there's all this hoo-ha over Sonos and this uh, and the the en- ending of uh, of upgrade life for um, for some of the original products that they made. Um, and people have sort of asked what my views are on this. Now, I have to be honest, I don't think my views on this are going to be necessarily what people were hoping me to say. I don't think it is in any way unreasonable to state as a company that you cannot upgrade or update a a, a range of products that are 10 years old any further. Um, that's just simply across not just audio across almost any other category i can think of that's completely par for the course um and i don't think that sonos is being in any way unreasonable by saying sonos is simply articulating something which the vast majority of other manufacturers have done i think it's just the way they've done it the way they've said it in the wording moving on to that there are two there are two things that i don't understand and i i do fervently hope that they're going to do some further work on i don't understand why a company with the resources of sonos can't have it so a work group of products some of which will continue to can receive updates and some of which can't i don't understand why it blanks off the products that can receiving can receive an update from doing so that makes no sense at all to me and i, I, I don't understand how that came to be that strikes me as a, a, a serious oversight when you uh, to put it into perspective if i um have uh two different name musos one from the first generation one from the second generation the first generation ones that's it they're, they're, i don't believe there's any further updates due for them but it's not going to stop the second generation one from receiving the update to start streaming cobuzz which is due in the next couple of days it makes no difference to those products that they can be accessed via the same same group so if name can do it i don't understand why sonos can't now the other thing and i have made more of a thing about this on twitter i have to say i find their um recycling uh system and i use the word recycling in the loosest possible sense because sonos doesn't do any recycling of their own they simply brick the unit and then invite you to take it to a a recycling center i dislike that entirely um the whole premise of this industry is built around product long, you know, long-lived products that will they they won't be state of the art but they continue working for as long you know for very long periods of time and could often be cajoled back into life without enormous recourse to spare parts this the for, the forced junking of things that still works will never sit happily with me so that i dislike entirely but in terms of them saying that after 10 years there's not going to be any further updates to product i'm sorry that's that's far from unreasonable yeah um, no, no, that's that's fair enough i mean you just have to look at um, yeah, you know, TVs and that, that kind of thing. You know, it's uh, uh, they have the best chips in them at the time, but it doesn't mean that five years down the line that chip's going to be able to handle the latest uh, coding for the iPlayer or Netflix or anything like that. You know, it's because no. they're they're always updating their code and they're all always updating how well it works. And you know, certain silicon can only do so much. So no, absolutely. So and I have to say, if you again, if you're still feeling aggrieved when you look at almost every single company which has 
built, built Sonos um, comp- competitive products, the vast majority of those <laughs> stopped receiving updates donkeys years ago. So um, yeah, that's uh, that's by the by, really. Um, the, the, people people asked for what my thoughts were on that, so the, those those are my thoughts. And uh, as this is being done on a Monday morning, those are my thoughts sober after a cup of coffee. So there you are. <laughs> <laughs> I need I need a firmware update. I really do. Right. Uh, I think okay. you need a complete factory reset. Yeah, yes. I think so. I think so. Uh, so that's a hard section done. We'll be back in a sec with some movies and some TV. Right, as we don't have any films to review this week, although I did get to see... You saw 1917, I did see it, yes, I, I did go and see it, and I took, uh, I think it was your advice to see it in IMAX. Yeah, yeah, it. I said see it in IMAX, yeah. Yeah, uh, 9 out of 10 from me. It, it, was, it was really, really good. Um, it, it wasn't uh, revolutionary in any way in terms of its storytelling or whatever. What was revolutionary was the way the camera moved. I have since watched a lot of the behind-the-scenes documentary stuff um, to see how they actually did it, and it was really, really impressive how they yeah, managed to yeah. move the camera around and uh, and the cameras that they used this the stability racks that they used and all that kind of thing so um and it was it was it was really interesting um a couple of times i was looking for the edit points because obviously it's one continuous shot or 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 it's designed to look like one continuous shot so it was interesting to see where sometimes the cam- they were pretty obvious sometimes it was <laughs> really obvious walk in front of the camera <laughs> yeah but even but even still walking in front of the camera you know they they would have to do it in a certain way and what i liked was the fact that it did feel like one continuous shot so you know a lot of care had been taken uh, I'm sure they walked through the scenes numerous times to to make it all work. But yeah, if, if you can get to see it at IMAX and it's still available this week, as far as I'm aware, um, in the IMAX screens, go see it because it's uh, it's a it's a piece of work that needs to be seen on the big screen. Uh, definitely in IMAX because it was designed for that format. So um, yeah, if you get the chance, go see it. Really, really good. It's uh, it's just won the Directors Guild Award last night for um, best director for Sam Mendes. So I'm I'm pretty sure at this point it's since it's won the Producers Guild Award as well. It's a shoe in for best film and best director at the Oscars. Yeah, at the yeah, um, yeah. No, it's uh, it's a fabulous piece of work and really beautiful. Although it's 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 war and it's it, you know the the horrors of war and all the rest of it. There are some absolute beautiful scenes in there. Um, mm. Roger Deakins knows what he's doing. He's my favourite cinematographer, um, and uh, yeah, it's 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 a real work of art, absolutely. Right. I was going to say, no, I was going to segue from that. If you if you don't want to see, um, well, if you want to see a different kind of photography, go and see the Lighthouse because that's black and white, one point one nine to one aspect ratio. I believe it's got a mono soundtrack. Yeah, <laughs> getting getting some really really good reviews. Yeah, and at, and at the same time, I know it's a film I will absolutely detest and won't be going to see because I think it's a really slow art house uh, style of of picture, which I'm I'm never a fan of, to be honest. Um, so I I don't know. I think I'll, I'll wait and see this on Netflix. Yeah, I think that's what I will do. Yeah, uh, but that's that's out this week, isn't it? Thirty first. Yeah, that's out this week on Friday, thirty first of January. Um, it stars Robert Patterson and Willem Dafoe as a pair of lighthouse keepers basically going nuts um, um, in a lighthouse. So I guess the clue's in the title. Uh, there's also out on Friday Richard Jewell, which is the new film from Clint Eastwood. Amazing that Clint's still knocking him out, given that he's 90 in May. Um, it seems to be spending his latter years making films about real-life events, because this is about a security guard who saved thousands of lives from an exploding bomb at the 1996 Olympics in Atlanta. Uh, and then was verified by journalists in the press who falsely reported that he was a terrorist. Uh, I can't say that I'm particularly interested in that, but any more than I've been interested. I've got to say, I don't think I've been interested in any of Clint's latter years' films. They've all been about subject matter that I'm just not interested in, um, like the Paris bomb and that kind of thing. Um, I'm, obviously, he's got some kind of, I don't know why, but he's obviously got some kind of interest in filming these real life events. He's the one that so. did the. Um, uh, I did Sully, which actually yes. was good. I have to say, that was actually, although not historic, you know, it did kind of vilify the, the NTSB, the NTSB yeah. Yeah. which was unfair. Um, but it did a great job of replic- you know, putting you in that aircraft. And, and so from that point of view, it was quite interesting. But yeah, for some reason, he just seems to be sending his last, his latter years um, doing real life um, sort of dramas. Um, I yeah. guess that's what he wants to do. I'm, I'm just make the guys still make films in 90. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and also coming out, and again, this is probably a film that's not going to resonate much with us because we're English or British, shall I say, um, is A Beautiful Day in the Neighbourhood, which is about um, Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers, uh, 
who I've heard of, but obviously we didn't grow up with Fred Rogers' TV show. Uh, this is about uh, the film's about the relationship between a journalist and um, and and Fred Rogers and in his later years. And it, Fred Rogers is played by Tom Hanks, which is probably perfect casting. If you want to watch, um, will you be my neighbour? Which is a documentary about Fred Rogers, which is I think probably more relevant for us who don't necessarily know anything about him, because that's amazing. Uh, and I guarantee, at some point in that documentary, you will cry. Um, and that's on Netflix, uh, at the yeah, moment, isn't it? Yeah, I think it is. Um, yeah, yeah, Fred Rogers basically he did a t- children's TV show for years and years and years in America, and introduced you know children concepts of things like you know racial integration at a time when that wasn't the case in the United States. And um, there's a bit you can find a bit on YouTube where he's um, a, a Senate hearing to uh, get funding for his because it's a public bro- public broadcasting show to get funding for it. And as a senator, he's basically you know at the beginning of this. In, in this um, Senate meeting is against him giving him any money. Fred Rogers and gives, spends 10 minutes explaining what he does and by the end of it the guy's given him the money and it's absolutely amazing to see. Um, so uh, I think probably from our perspective the documentary would be more interesting but anyway Tom Hanks is always good value and um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting story about someone but it's more about the person's relationship with Fred Rogers um, than it is about the guy's life. So if you want to see something about his life which is amazing then watch um and what won't you be my neighbour? Well there you go. It's got Forrest Gump in it, what more can you ask for? That's it. Yeah. Uh right, disc wise, Steve, uh, there's only one four K release this week. Yeah, Ad Astra, uh, which I've gotten watched already. Um Saw it the cinema, Moon Pirates. Saw it at the Moon cinema Pirates. and it bored me. Yeah, no, do you know what? It's weird. Um, I, I enjoyed it more the second time around, maybe because I was sat at home and um it's a good looking disc, it's a two K DI. Um but it does look nice um, uh, in HDR, and uh, it's got a great Atmos soundtrack. It, it, I found it more interesting the second time round, and I did find quite interesting listening to the commentary track, just to see the director's point of view, because clearly there are enormous, you know, scientific inaccuracies in the film, and and I think you know you should always be you know try not to say. I think the problem with well, I, I had with the film the first time I saw it was I went into it thinking it was going to be historic. Yeah, sorry, not historically. I thought it was going to be scientifically accurate. And it clearly it is not <laughs> even remotely. Um, but when you listen to his commentary track, he sort of does admit that that was never the intention, um, and perhaps it was mismarketed that way. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I did find it more interesting the second time round than the first time round. Um, that might just be because I was more comfortable and I could have a cup of tea and go for a toilet break. Well, I watched it for uh, the second time on on uh, the flight to Vegas, and and it still bored bored me. I found it really quite pretentious, to be honest. Oh, it's pretentious. And. <laughs> And I didn't understand the relationship um, and why it was important. You know, I didn't understand that point. I, it was like, well, what, what, what you trying? What point are you trying to make here? It felt very, I don't know, meandering in terms of what it was trying to say. Um, and I'm He's really sure it had a lot to say. To I mean, the idea of those um, space pirates on the moon. You know, if you leave tire tracks on the moon, they're there for billions of years. So if you want to find out where their base is, just follow the tire tracks back to where they came from. <laughs> <laughs> it's like they're going to blow away. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, scientifically, it's cobblers. Um, I, I guess the point it was trying to make was, you know, that we instead of searching for life on out, or, uh, out in, the, in in space, we should be concentrating on the life we've got here on Earth. But um, yeah, basically, it was pitched as 2001 meets Apocalypse Now, and that's kind of what it is. Okay, uh, right. So that's 4K Blu-ray. It does, sound, it does look and sound good, disc-wise. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. You are the type uh, of person to be fair, that just Steve, buys yeah, things. That, that is that is how <laughs> most of your disc collection appears to have been assembled. Although I've got, I've got to say, I went into HMV the other day because I had a twenty-pound uh, gift card from. From, from Christmas, and I thought I'm gonna go and get something. Your <laughs> Christmas card at your age. <laughs> well, you see, you still you still get stuff like that. So anyway, uh, I, they do two for thirties at the minute. So there was, I went in and I ended up buying four for fifty, <laughs> because HMV what? do a thing now that they have two prices on certain discs, and if you buy one disc, then you can have a second disc at, at the second price. So it's it's something like nineteen ninety nine or nine ninety nine when bought with something else. So I bought my two for thirty, and then I bought Bad Boys and Bad Boys Two on four K for nine ninety nine each. I thought so you already had those. I had them on Blu-ray. I didn't have them on four K. So, so there you That's go. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so yeah, I ended up coming out with more than I, I, I intended on that one. So, uh, but I've got to say, the choice for for four K, it seems to be really slowing down, and and it's definitely something we're going to come on to this year, I think, because I think we're going to see some changes when it comes to physical media. Anyway, uh, Blu-ray releases. Steve. Blu-ray reviews. You've got Hotel Mumbai. I think the review's already up on the website um, about the terrorist attacks in Mumbai. Um, there's Downton Abbey. Obviously, the film version of the TV series. Again, I think the review might already be up. Uh, Sancho, The Bailiff, as a Criterion Blu-ray. I have no idea what that is. Uh, the Miracle Worker on Eureka. I know that's... Um, isn't that about the um, the woman who taught... Um, Helen Keller. Helen Keller, thank you. I think it's about Helen Keller. And the woman who taught her to communicate to her, managed to communicate to her, which can't have been an easy job, um, given where he started from. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be honest, that is a miracle. <laughs> can't have been easy. Yeah. Uh, I, can't, I wouldn't even know where to start. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think that's Anne Bancroft, I think, uh, from memory. Anyway, um, that's that. That's out on Eureka. As uh, Cloak and Dagger on Eureka. I don't know what that is. Uh, and there's also the BBC's His Dark Materials, BBC HBO co-production of His Dark Materials, which um, season one, which was on just before Christmas. Uh, Hot- I quite enjoy. Hotel Mumbai is on which streaming services? I think it's Sky, oh, isn't it's it? Sky production, isn't yeah. it? So it's available on Sky. So it is available Sky. on Sky, yeah. Uh, in UHD as well, I think. Uh, Streaming-wise... We've got one film out on Friday uh, from Netflix. This is an Oscar contender, uh, Uncut Gems, which is one of those rare films with a good performance from Adam Sandler. Apparently, it's really good. He plays a diamond a, a diamond uh, dealer who gets involved in a criminal scheme. But apparently, it's actually really good. Um, and he's very, very good in it. Uh, so I will probably check that out over the weekend when it comes up on Netflix. Um, um, and he's already done his, his life-affirming performance in You Don't Mess With The Zohan, which is just underrated, <laughs> greatly underrated. Um, so this is merely adding to the, uh, the breadth of time. <laughs> yeah, well, it's making up for 10 years of utter cobblers that he's been spewing out at uh, well, Netflix mainly, who obviously are, are enabling him. <laughs> but yeah, I suppose if you chuck it, you know, you throw enough stuff at the wall, eventually one thing good will stick. Uh, so this is probably it. Uh, did you guys watch Picard? Yeah, we're just I, coming, I was just coming on to this because... Uh, okay. You know, best of the TV of the week um, has to be Picard. Disappointing that we're not getting it in 4K HDR. That, but I've got to say, I watched. I don't know if it was, good, know if it was produced in 4K because uh, Discovery was 1080p, wasn't it? But it was at least in HDR or oh, Dolby Vision on Netflix. I don't know why they're not doing why Amazon aren't doing it in HDR. They're not hiding it away somewhere, are they? Because they have a bad habit of doing. No, it. I, I did. No, no, I no, did no. search it out, and it yeah, wasn't so there. Um, so. so did I. So did I. But I was searching on Friday and they have a bad habit sometimes of not releasing the HDR thing or the 4 UHD thing until, you know, a couple of days later it suddenly appears. So might be worth having a recheck just in case. But yeah, that that's disappointing. Um, but, you know, um, production-wise, clearly it, money's on the screen. Yeah, it looks superb. I, I watched it on the projector and then I watched it on the TV. Uh, so I watched it twice because the way I watched my head... It on the project. My head, the way my head is at the minute, I just thought uh, I need to watch that again. <laughs> I'm sure. I mean, um, I'd go. Yeah, I'd it lent itself to that. It's a reminder, obviously, as well that um, Pat, let, let's face it, there there are definite upsides to, ha- to to making use to to building a series around someone who can actually act. Um, you know, which Patrick Stewart maybe can not move very fast. <laughs> No, no, no. This is the uh, this is this is one you know. But equally, that said, it wasn't like um, uh, the Irishman. They made you know they made no bones about it when he was yeah. when he he was it, during the point where he was invited to flee. No spoilers. It made it abundantly clear that that there will be very little fleeing in in in, in, in the car because yeah. it makes a bit. He is old. It's not like seventy nine. I think you know, yeah. unlike unlike um, Brent Spiner, who unfortunately has to play a character who doesn't age, and there are some. In, limitations with that um i, I still yeah. I, I thought they did all, all right with i that, thought no absolutely the, the Major didn't look much, any much much older than he was in nemesis so yeah. i guess uh yeah yeah you know they're but, just putting on more and more slap somebody, but, um, somebody said in the comments it felt like a, a comfortable pair of slippers and I, and I would say that's kind of how it felt to me um i i think your your uh, enjoyment of it will depend on whether or not you're a star trek fan yes. i am not ever have been a star trek fan most of, i mean i've seen the original series on tv when i was a kid i've watched bits of next generation and deep space nine and voyager and never seen an episode of enterprise um mostly i know star trek from the movies um and so if if, if you know to know it from the movies you'll probably quite like it i did watch this morning while i was having breakfast there was a red letter media did their review of the first episode those guys are star trek fans and they tear it to pieces um, because 
yeah, I think Star Trek fans probably won't like it any more than they like Discovery. Um, but if you're not a Star Trek fan, uh, you probably won't quite like it. Yeah, it, it's it's worse than Star Wars when it comes down to fan service. Um, yeah, but equally, yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's it's a case of the uh, the being staying relevant, being around thing. I, as someone who did, I still every now and again I watch an episode of Next Generation. Um, uh, there, there was a point in that where, so they, 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 you know, they were talking about certain, certain, high, you know, concepts and ideals, and that felt it felt I felt very at home with that. Um, and yeah, I mean, obviously, part of part of the issue was that um, one of the reasons I always it, it, actually it's a pattern across a lot of television series that I like is that that fundamentally, the, you know, they're episodic in nature with overarching themes across seasons and so on and so forth but every now and again it'll just be a closed episode and and obviously this isn't going to be that and i i i've never felt that it's as effective in 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 terms of episodes of star trek um every now and again you want to take time out and examine a plant that eats people or something like that and they it, it was just part of the the chart the charming sort of weirdness of the show and that this isn't clear is clearly not going to do that um but you know what can you do it, that, that's how modern television is, is being is being done you know re- relentless 10 episode monsters that um, cost lots of money i'm not sure if the weekly episode thing will work for this i don't I, to be honest phil i'm not 100 percent sure it works at all in the current climate people don't seem to like it anymore I, i'm completely happy to acknowledge that i'm in uh, in a, a minority i i think that it depends it can still like um watchmen watchmen definitely you know which was a weekly thing because it's hbo um that that did generate a lot of word of mouth a lot of you know cool, water cooler moments and and buzz and and building up for each episode so i think it can still be done if you've got a strong enough story to maintain that interest yeah um so we'll see. I mean, we're only one have a, one episode in, which is like if you consider it to be a, a ten hour movie, means we're like you know we're ten minutes into the first, you know, ten minutes into yeah. the film. So, and so we've got far, a long way to go yet. So far, so far it's, it's, it's it piqued my interest. Um, uh, I think you know it ticked all the. It, you know, I think they say red letter media, and it's true. You know, it, it was probably written by people who, who know nothing about Star Trek because you think about it. What would I know nothing about Star Trek? So if you said to me Picard, I'd say Captain of the Enterprise drinks Earl Grey tea, says make it so. He'll have a dog called Number One. <laughs> He lives on a, on a. I know. He, I know. He was from a family that ran a vineyard. Um, he was. He, you know. He had a robot. You know. A friend called Data. That it, it just ticked. Oh, he's part of the Borg, wasn't he, for a bit? So the Borg will probably be in it. So you know, you can kind of guess what's going to be in the show just based upon what limited knowledge I have of of, of Picard from watching the Star Trek movies mainly. Um, I'm looking we'll forward. To, I'm but, looking forward to seven and eight. Oh yeah, yeah, she's in it, isn't she? Mm. Actually, I think don't Riker, right? I'm, most of them pop up at some point because I've, I've seen the trailers and it's like Riker and Troy and whoever else is still alive. I guess he's not <laughs> paycheck. To pay. I mean, I went sort of who's alive in the series, but of course it also can mean who's alive in real life. <laughs> and looking for that, you know, a little bit of paycheck, a little bit of scratch. <laughs> Yeah, oh, we've all been there. Yeah. So I, I knew it, it wasn't going to sit well with Star Trek fans. None of the new stuff is sitting well with Star Trek fans, and they are they're they're far worse than Star Wars fans when it comes to um, yeah, that kind of thing. yeah. They've got uh, there's a whole industry, isn't there, of technical manuals and stuff like that for Star Trek. So yeah, yeah. If you uh, if you go off, you know, I mean, Discovery, I can understand a lot of their ire towards that. I mean, certainly it's meant to be a prequel series, but it didn't seem to tie in with anything. It introduced a character that no one's ever mentioned before, and um, and then the second season just went off the cliff. <laughs> it just yeah. gave up. Well, it jumped. It jumped the shark. The it? thing is, uh, at the end of the second like, why don't they just make a series about the early adventures of the Enterprise? Because that was the bit I liked. <laughs> Captain Pike, number one, and Spock. Go yeah. off and make Pike, that series. Pike was good, yeah. Really yeah, good. That, yeah. that was a good start. Just, I, I would happily watch that series. The only thing I'd I add have to no season three uh, of Discovery. Sorry. The only thing I'd add to this uh, on that sort of theme is someone did point out on Twitter, really hope the positive reception for Picard prompts the development of Star Trek Kirk, a completely nonsensical Shatner vehicle that utterly degrades everyone involved. I would watch that. <laughs> I would definitely watch that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, other new TV was, uh, Ed mentioned it at the start, Top Gear is is back. Um I have to say I have not laughed at a TV program in such a long time as I did uh, the the opening of the new season last night. Um, although it was painful to laugh because every time I cough, 
my ribs are, are so sore and raw. But um, it was thoroughly entertaining. It's back to its best, and the chemistry just I have to be honest, works. the moment when they were talking about there's always someone with an American car who's a proper wrong and and I thought, oh, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> <laughs> How lovely, yes. Uh, so, yeah. I, no, I mean, yeah, in terms of whether whether it's, it is actually spontaneous or whether it's all care, carefully, carefully uh, sorted out ahead of time, it's a perfectly watchable hour of television. The thing is, there are absolute nutcases that are... I mean, that bungee jump in the metro. Yes. That was just edgy, you see. I mean, you know he's going to survive because he's just done the studio link. But, you know, it, <laughs> it's it's just... It was edgy your seat stuff. It was like you are a f***ing nutcase for doing this. All respect to you, dude. That, what that was, he was doing? just something. He, the bungee jumped who, who, a metro. Who was it? Flintoff. Flintoff. You have to go and watch it, Steve. It is. Yeah. It was, it was I, I, really so entertaining. Are you saying the show's found its mojo then? Yes, absolutely. Oh yeah, I yeah. would say so. And it would appear that they've put some effort into getting the other two able to do more solo driving segments on their own taking meaning there's going to be people other than harris doing more review things which appeals um and it does appear that they you know some of it i i mean i didn't find the lube stuff as funny as i suspect a number of people but uh, nevertheless it is that there is a a sort of that there is a, a a chemistry and balance which hasn't been there for quite a long time and um the other thing that's i suppose just as important is it's like oh yeah it's been fine but that's because they've been going to locations x y and z last night they went from um suffolk to essex weirdly via hampshire no was it i can't remember where did they start no bognor regis so went from bognor regis to essex uh via actually very close to where my parents live um so and and they did so in 1500 well no 1800 quids worth of cars um it it you know, there wasn't. It wasn't a. You know, we've taken them to the other side of the world thing and, and stuff like that. It <laughs> it, it it just worked, yeah. and um, it would appear that Paddy McGuinness is is going to buy a Ford Escort of some description yeah. <laughs> for almost any challenge that he's set to do. But and see, I quite this, like the mechanics of the, that. Yeah, this is what I like. That you know, they're they're down to earth. There's no pretension there, and and they're off their nut. I mean, Flintoff will do anything. He doesn't seem to have any fear. Which could be a really dangerous thing because he—I mean—he's already crashed the car once with them in it, a serious crash. So, but that's what makes it exciting. That's what makes you want to watch it and, and come back to it. Whereas the other three—I mean, I watched Seaman um, over Christmas and and, and it was—I was bored rigid. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms yeah. of Jeopardy, again, the the Top Gear Christmas special in Nepal was there. There was altogether more risk inherent in that. Uh, which, you know, as I say, and obviously uh, they did once again manage to upset a lot of people by taking what is one of the last Peugeots I would ever consider owning, you know, before they moved into the current swathe of utter mediocrity and destroyed that in... What, the rally? Yeah. Yeah, I know. That was a shame. In the same way that the only right-hand drive Matra Bagheera was destroyed in in blooming Thailand. But nevertheless, let's ignore that for the moment. Uh, It's... It, yeah, it, it. I was. I mean, obviously, I, I thought it was going to be a, a sort of Giacomo advert when they announced that uh, lineup. But nevertheless, um, <laughs> it uh, no, it, it, it's starting to work. Uh, the yeah, only thing they do need to do is they need to. Uh, it, you can't last night with the aerial atom, and it's like okay, it's abundantly clear. They sent it out. They had no choice but to send it out when it was extremely cold, and it, it didn't achieve very much. But you do really need to show um, uh, the if you, you need to show the laps. It's, it's not, you know. Let's face it. It's less than a minute's worth of footage. It's worth showing. Uh, it just makes some sense in the context of demonstrating what the car does. When, when rather than saying we sent the stick out earlier, here is the time. Don't like that. There you go. Otherwise, yeah. fine. Yeah, but uh, he was right about the tyres as well. They do absolutely nothing under six degrees, so you know it needed to be. It needs to run it again in the summer to get the real times out of that car. Yeah. So yes, I I thought that was uh, I, it. It, thor- it passed some time. Uh, I'm enjoying uh, best home cook as well and a random other. other I'll tell you, what I've been enjoying Ed uh, all new series of uh, the um, Forged and Fire on Discovery. <laughs> 
Is that on Now TV as well? Or... No, I think uh, it's on now. No, yeah. Never mind. Yeah. Will it, will it still cut and will it still kill? Oh yes, it's been it's been really entertaining, <laughs> and and I've got to say they're getting more and more redneck in in the people taking part as the weeks go on. It's really entertaining. I, I, how could they get more redneck if they're yeah. Like uh, yeah, forging well, their own swords? <laughs> Yeah, well, they found a way. Instruments in general. Yeah, they yeah, found no, a way. It's good stuff. Uh, right. Okay. So that's Top Gear and uh, Picard. Uh, the lots of things have come out over Christmas. I've got a list of stuff that I really need to to work my way through. One of the annoying things at this Phillips event, Steve, was you know how people do demos, but they do demos yeah, of of stuff, of stuff, you, stuff that you haven't seen yet. Um, and they decided to play. Uh, I think it was episode eight or something of of this season, uh, season two of Lost in Space. I, I couldn't watch the screen. It was like, no, I, I don't want this spoiled. Sorry, I ain't watching yeah, this. I, I watched Lost in Space over Christmas. Thoroughly enjoyed it. I thought it was a really good, sex, strong second season. Effects are top notch. It was. Um, I just love the way they go from one disaster to the next. It's each episode. It's like they get out of one mess and they're into another one. Uh, this season, even more so. I think they just pile it on and pile it on. Um, but I thought it was it was really good. Um, uh, and really tense and I, and I really enjoyed it I thought it was a, a really solid second season so I'm looking forward to more of that hopefully because um, I was disappointed to discover that Mindhunter has been not cancelled but Delayed. should we say put on hold put on hold at least until uh, same as um, uh, Ewan McGregor's Obi-Wan has been put yeah on hold that's well. been delayed as well I don't know what's going on there I can only assume um, all is not well <laughs> at Lucasfilm post the rise of Skywalker <laughs> Which, um, which is a shame because Mandalorian has done so well for no, him. Um, that's that's onto its second season. That's going fine. But I mean, maybe I mean I don't know. I'm I'm sure there's these days that Lucasfilm is is, is filmmaking by committee, isn't it? So there's so many uh, Disney putting their or in Disney executives with their notes and the the the, the, the script team or the, the story story team uh, at Lucasfilm all this sort of stuff going on. So I guess yeah. I mean it sounds as though they weren't happy with the uh, first couple of scripts. Um, which happened on Picard too. Actually, Picard had a lot of issues initially in terms of production. So I, I think I don't think it's unusual on modern TV shows, especially when there's so much resting on it. And and you need to, you know, with these, with, I think these days, you know, with these streaming shows, they're so expensive, and they need to, you know, grab you first episode. First, you've got one, maybe two episodes to get people's attention as they just go and watch something else because there's so much choice now that, you know, you need to really – so maybe they just didn't think it was strong enough. But I one thing, one show I watched I wasn't particularly interested in, knew nothing about really, never played the video game, never read the books, was The Witcher, which I watched over Christmas and really enjoyed, uh, although it is quite confusing in terms of its structure initially to work out what's going on. But, um, but that was a surprise for me. I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. I caught up with the Deuce. Um, I think I mentioned it last week because it had CES in it. Uh, that was really good, a really, really good series. To, if you haven't seen it, so you can watch all that on now at the moment. Um, there's a new – oh, Curb Your Enthusiasm's back tomorrow, Tuesday, uh, on Sky, Sky Comedy. Um, I love that show, so I'm looking forward to that. There's um, a new series by Armando Iannucci called Avenue 5 about a spaceship that's um, – Yeah, I've seen, the, seen the trailer for that. So I watched the first episode. Yeah. Okay, but uh, we'll see. That that one didn't grab me as much. I mean, I think I prefer him when he's doing political comedy, but um, uh, we'll see about that. But yeah, there was an absolute ton of stuff over Christmas that they just dropped left, right, and center. And um, and uh, I got some, you know, the, the amount of money they're spending on these shows these days is staggering. So uh, at least you're getting production values along with it and cast, you know, and, and uh, big name stars and all that kind of stuff. So. Uh, we're interested to see what happens with uh, Lord of the Rings when they, we know when they're spending a billion dollars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's still Lord uh, of the Rings. Yeah, I think there might be a mistake there. I don't know if anyone was really interested after the Hobbit. <laughs> but, I was uh, a bit anyway. I, I, I'm a bit skeptical of that. I was a bit lower budget, I, I, lower budget ish in what show. I I thoroughly enjoyed uh, James May in Japan. Uh, yeah, I am really acutely good. I'm acutely aware that uh, he there was a lot of crossover. Uh, between him and the mad motorcycling Channel 4 bloke, whose name has now completely escaped oh, me. Guy, uh, uh, Guy, Guy Martin, Martin. Martin. That's it. Yeah. Um, and it's a totally different presentational style. Um, and Guy Martin is practical and capable of doing things like making swords where James May is not. But nevertheless, I thoroughly enjoyed that. I thought it was it was you know, it, it did show some stuff I hadn't necessarily seen before. Uh, and uh, I, I think that competitive snowball fighting has a great future ahead of it. Yeah. Um, I, so I, liked, was... I liked the fact that it didn't do the usual 
Um, or if you go down this dark alleyway, you can buy used knickers out of this vending machine and that kind of thing. You know, yeah, he did fall into all the usual Japanese yeah, cliches. Yeah, yeah. Which I think the Jonathan Ross, when he did it, it was full of that, wasn't it? it was oh, just, there's loads yeah. of shows where they do Japan, and it's always the same. Let's go to the big penis festival and let's yeah, go to this. Yeah. It's the same. Actually, I think he does do that. They did one. do the penis. Uh, yeah, yeah. But it, uh, yeah, not. He didn't leave every cliche unturned, at least um, stone unturned. But uh, yeah, but, I, I like the, I like yeah, the fact that he did the North Island as well because nobody ever covers that. Yeah, uh, so, yeah, which is an amazing, like amazing place. Yeah, um, and then on Netflix, I th- I thoroughly enjoyed the second season of Final Space. I don't know if anyone else has been watching that. Uh, I thought I, it's the Final Space is is a bit weird because the pilot, which is the first episode of the first series, um, is tonally at odds largely at odds with how the rest of it sort of then panned out but it had some it's it's it, it had some really it, 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 rare moments of a rare combination of at times being bloody funny uh and actually having some 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 quite decent emotion e- emotional content to it as well so if you're looking for something which happens in 20 minute burps that's quite good as well um and there was something else that i absolutely consumed and I can't, uh, I can't remember what it was. I will say that a second season of Hyperdrive has been greenlit as well. <laughs> so are you, as you happy then? Oh, dang! You know, gladiators with cars. What more could you possibly? Make? I, um, I forgot to mention the Expanse season four, which was on on Amazon, which I really, it's a show that they've picked up now. They're now producing it, and that was really good. They, they, they that did a great job. Although it was a bit annoying that. When they were in space, it was uh, well, back on the uh, solar system. It was um, 1.85, 1.78 to one. And then when they were on this alien planet, they kept going to scope ratio, which annoyed me because I would normally watch it on the big screen. <laughs> but yeah. that meant, uh, but I guess that's that's a, a specific problem for people like us, uh, Phil. But uh, otherwise, it was really good, um, and I really enjoyed that. And also, there's a great show um, on Netflix again um, called The Confession Killer, uh, which is a documentary a short, short documentary series. Um, about Henry Henry Lee Lucas, um, who is technically America's most prolific serial killer. He confessed to killing hundreds and hundreds of people. However, <laughs> it's quite possible that he killed two people and just copped to all the others. Um, it's really good. If you haven't seen it, watch it. It's, it's structured in a brilliant way where each episode ends on a cliffhanger <laughs> and you're like, oh, I've got to see what happens next. Um, so it's it was really interesting. Um, you know, I went from knowing about Henry Lucas from having seen the film Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer and, you know, thinking he was this mass murderer who went around on a killing spree all around America. And then you watch the documentary and realise that everything you thought you knew about Henry Lee Lucas probably isn't true. Uh, so worth checking out. Um, it's, uh, it's a very interesting documentary with some really interesting uh, sort of left field turns, something you're not expecting. OK, good stuff. Um, uh, for me, uh, this weekend is going to be a big weekend coming because it's Super Bowl Sunday. Anybody else interested in Super Bowl? Um, look, I know it's not a major event. It, I just, I, 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 one, I find American football extraordinarily complicated, and I just, I mean, as I haven't had traumatic brain injuries, I don't find the need to to break everything down into sort of thirty seconds of action interspersed with long periods of standing around. If I want that, I watch cricket. Um, yeah. so. <laughs> Well, you see, it's it's something I got into um, probably with a lot of other people my generation. We got into it around about 1984 when Channel 4 did the whole um, NFL thing. And, and uh, I can still remember the theme tune was Two Tribes, Frankie Goes to Hollywood. And yeah, they, right. they, made a, they made a big thing of it. And, and of course, at the age I was back then, I, I got hooked on it. And... Um, just like everything else in life, I mean, you choose your football team, you got to stick by it. Well, you know, the Bears were the team to be at, at that moment in time. So, did they have the did they have the fridge in their team? The fridge, yeah, and yeah. Walter Payton and Jim McMahon was a quarterback. I mean, I can name these people: John Singletary in the in the defense and so on, because I was absolutely obsessed with it back then. And uh, and like I say, I chose the Chicago Bears. They've been shit ever since. They only ever won. <laughs> yeah, They've the done it no- done nothing since, but. I lost touch with it over the years, and it wasn't till uh, they started doing the um, uh, Monday morning catch up on YouTube that I started watching that again. And as soon as I had Sky back in, Sky cover all the games or nearly all the games every weekend. So I've really gotten back into it. And even when I was out in Vegas, um, they had the playoff games um, on the Saturday and Sunday when I was out there. So I was, I was, and because I was West Coast and and uh, these games were East Coast. 
So the um, so yeah, so it was it was quite early in the day, so I could watch the games. Um, so I, I've really gotten into it this year, and I've been following the teams this year and so on. So um, actually following them getting to the Super Bowl. So it's the Chiefs and the 49ers in the Super Bowl this year. Um, the Chiefs have a a real star quarterback um, who's uh, who's gonna be huge. I mean, he's a young guy. He's twenty four. It's called Mahomes. He's just an absolute superstar. Whereas the 49ers They've gone back to old school running team and all the rest of it, and it's it's shaping up to be a really really interesting game. So if you've any interest in that and how the Americans go way over the top with everything that they do, um, it will certainly be worth staying up for, um, even if you just watch the first half and then the the halftime show. It, it's always entertaining. Um, but I've really gotten back into it this year. Unfortunately, back in those days, I got into um, sumo and kabaddi on Channel Four instead. <laughs> Channel Kibadi 4 was, was a great these, channel sort of, back then. Yeah, I know. They did some really interesting... But Kabaddi basically was like, you know, um, sort of Pakistani uh, British Bulldog, wasn't it? Yeah, but you had to hold your breath and shout. <laughs> you had to hold Kibadi. your breath yeah. while doing it, yeah. Um, it was brutal. Like, all this and that. more used to be on, like, tran- <laughs> Trans World Sport, which, it has to be said, in 2020 would mean something completely different. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but that used, to cover, that used to cover all manner of different different random events do you remember the one with the pole fights and i can't remember which uh asian country it's in but it starts with people that there's a team of like 20 people and they hold up it's like a telegraph pole with a bloke on the top of it and then another team of 20 people attack them to get the bloke off the pole um and again it's just crying out for the sort of in-depth coverage that the premier league currently enjoys it we had everything going for it so yeah i i, I miss that as well along with football italia oh uh, yeah yeah Lazio. i suppose since we're talking about sport we should probably mention that kobe bryant died last night he did yes, yes. I, I, what lost. shocked me was um the nba didn't cancel any games they, they went ahead and played the oh, games. Oh, no, money. <laughs> You're yeah, kidding? I know. <laughs> it's all but you would, you would have thought of somebody of that stature, though, you in think, that sport. Ah, well, no, no, yeah. no. Hang on. I suppose the counter to that, someone did point this out on Twitter. In the specific case of Kobe Bryant, now, um, what I understand about basketball can be written on the back of a stamp, so I am taking this on face value. But he uh, was known, if nothing else, for a truly ferocious work ethic. So if there was anyone who would have probably insisted that the games go ahead, it would have been Kobe Bryant. So that's, uh, but I don't necessarily believe that that is something that was a specific decision making process uh, of the NBA. As Steve says, I think money talks, but it's, it, it's a, a, a terrible shame. I do feel, I mean, especially the lo- the loss of his daughter as well. Yeah, that was um, yeah. Yeah, that's very sad. Um, but uh, I suppose he got more done in 41 years <laughs> than, than, than most of us are likely to do in double that. So there is that. So uh, obviously a terrible shame. Um, and uh, yeah, there's and, no, no, and there no was quite a few in the, in the helicopter, wasn't there? there it does was... appear to have been quite a busy helicopter. Yes. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I like helicopters very much. It's one of my ambitions to learn how to fly on them. But uh, it unfortunately, whilst they don't f- just fall out of the sky, it they, they are intrinsically more risky than things oh, that can naturally very... glide. Well, because if something goes wrong, <laughs> there's, yeah, there's no aerodynamics there. It's yeah. going you straight down like you a brick. Glide, no, yeah. Well, they, they auto-rotate yeah. auto auto rotate but... to a point, but if they have a rotor failure, they don't because no. the bit that allows for auto-rotation is has failed. So, yeah, it's it's not not ideal. Uh, very unfortunate. But again, what, 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 a, what an existence. So, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, for somebody who doesn't follow the NBA or basketball or whatever, I knew his name. Well, and, it's true. That, There's yeah, only, yeah, that, exactly. only a finite number of of, yeah. of, of, of sporting figures who Kobe, transcend Shaq, their sport. Magic, yeah. Michael Jordan. Yeah. Those are the four yeah. I know. <laughs> but I've never ever watched an NBA game, but I knew his name, and that that just shows you how big a sports star he is. If he, you know, if, if he's crossing over into the mainstream and people do know his name, so yeah, yeah. What a legacy! I suppose the only thing you can say. Okay, uh, and on that, that's it for this week's podcast. Uh, we should have a full compliment again next week, hopefully. Um, like we said at the beginning of this podcast, we had to shuffle things around because people uh, weren't available, and then uh, it's a good job that we did shuffle it around because I don't think we would have gotten a podcast <laughs> recorded over the weekend <laughs> with the state that I've been in. But anyway, that's it for this week. My thanks to Steve Withers. In the buttocks. <laughs> and Ed Selly.
I'm pretty tired. I think I'll go home now. Don't forget, you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook, bookmark avforums.com for latest reviews, news and videos. Plus, why not leave us a five-star rating on iTunes, but only if you enjoyed the show. Also, head over and check out our YouTube channel for the latest videos on product launches and reviews. And while you're there, feel free to subscribe. I'm Phil Linton. Thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you again next week. Yeah.